Please welcome Terry Jones. There you go. Hey, man. Great to see you. How are you? Nice to be here. Likewise. Welcome. Thank you. Um, it's, it's quite an undertaking to sit there and say, okay, guys, we're going to be really funny, and um, we're going to talk about you know, how, how scary it is in your own mortality. Uh, yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, and I think that's what drew me to when Rob Buckman uh, suggested doing these uh, series of films. Um, it's uh, for a website. And uh, I think that's what uh, drew me to it, to, to actually use comedy as something that can change your lifestyle. And but when you got the diagnosis, it, it's, could you imagine for yourself, hey, I'm going to use comedy? <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, when I got uh, the diagnosis of bowel cancer, I actually, it didn't worry me. I don't, I don't know why, but... What do you um, mean? I, well, I just never worried about it. The, the only time I worried about it was um, uh, when the lady came to reassure me that, I, that uh, having a, a, a colostomy bag yeah. was all right. And then I worried. <laughs> <laughs> like, I might actually have to hold on to oh, one yeah, of these. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And actually, in fact, I didn't have to have a colostomy bag, actually, in the end, because my... Rectum is a very odd shape. It's wiggly and uh, <laughs> odd as it's in full that it full the surgeons. Well, you have a special rectum, I suppose. Well, I suppose so, yes. <laughs> and so you, you was that always a, the way you looked at the world? Like you were you weren't the worrying type? I, well, I don't know. Um, I, I used to be. I used to write terribly when I was uh, uh, small. I used to write terribly miserable poetry and uh, um, I was like seven years old or something like that, or ten years. Yeah, and but. Uh, uh, yes, I've, I've, I've got. I, I think it's because I enjoy what I'm doing, and uh, so I've become an optimist actually. So I, I just didn't worry me. So you clearly are one of the few people who's been able to be okay with his own mortality, even facing it. <laughs> but when a lot of my friends who've recently had kids tell me that the, the one thing is that they started to think of themselves as they get older, because they see yeah, their daughters yeah, too. Yeah. They're 39. Yeah, yeah. Hey, when my daughter's graduating high school, I'll be this yeah. old. You just recently had a kid. I know. At, it's a, that's at 67. A, I know, and I. I you know, I hope I'm around for another 20 years so I can see it grow up. Does it, does it make you look at your mortality differently? Um, well, it makes me determined not to be ill. <laughs> <laughs> and then you put health. Yeah, yeah. What's, I was just thinking about, you know, we were watching the bio and you were standing over there. I wonder what your relationship was like with the legacy of Monty Python. Um, well, it makes the world a smaller place, really, because it's like, you know, you've got somebody to talk about and somebody to talk about with, with anybody you meet. And uh, so and it's like having a, you know, it's like, like when you're a, ch uh, you're, you're a baby and everybody goes over the pram and goes, ooh, who's a coochie coochie coo? Yes. So, so it's uh, a bit like that, you know. So, oh, oh, you're in Monty Python. Oh, yes, ooh, coochie coochie And do they do all those bits to you? <laughs> no, 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 they don't do them. <laughs> do you ever look at them and like, don't touch me now? <laughs> Um, but the, uh, have you ever had a moment where you needed to get away from that? Um, no, because it's actually, you know, it's enabled me to do other things, like, um, for example, my academic work, um, and my history stuff. Uh, um, it, I don't think I'd have, uh, if I wrote a book on Chaucer uh, and I hadn't done Monty Python, I don't think anybody would have published it. But, uh, yeah, that's the thing. You decided, I'm going to become a historian, yeah, which is what you did. Yeah, well, yeah. And I wondered why you wanted to do that. Were you always on a quest for answers in your life? Um, well, no, it's just I got fascinated by uh, the idea of Chaucer's Night, and I wanted to discover what, it, what Chaucer was actually talking about. This is in the, uh, the, the, the prologue to the Canterbury Tales. Um, and that drew me into the late 14th century, history of the late 14th century. And, and for then, you know, that, the, when you dive into that world, it all expands and you get interested in other things. And, uh... But you updated it even, I mean, in your post 9 11 book, I mean, you were very direct towards the American administration and the British administration. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. And yes. so w when you were writing that, did you think to yourself, this is a good idea? <sighs> well, no, it was just I couldn't remain. When I saw the Iraq, the Iraq war and the, uh, the, 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 our governments going into the Iraq war, I just couldn't remain silent. I, I just had to write something about it. And, uh, uh, and so uh, that's, that's what I did. I wrote columns for The Guardian and, uh, and that's, you know, doesn't affect anything, but uh, it didn't stop us going to war. Yeah, but, but do you feel like that it was, you said you couldn't remain silent. Yeah. And so was it one of those things where you recognize as, as a person with a brand, as a person that people recognize, yeah, yeah. that you were going to step out on a ledge? Did you receive flack for it? Did you get criticism within uh, your own country? Um, well, I, no, I didn't actually. Um, I think everybody agreed with what I was saying. <laughs> I think, you know, the well, not everybody, they went to war. Well, yeah, but, but then it was the government that went to war, you know? 
And uh, I, I, uh, I was reading a, 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 an arms, an in-house magazine for the arms industry called Weapons Today before the first Gulf War. And the editorial was headed, thank God for Saddam. And it was all about how, as you know, after the collapse of the, uh, of the perestroika, after the collapse of communism and perestroika, mm -hmm. the arms industry has been in the doldrums and the order books have been empty. Uh, but now we've got a, a real enemy uh, who nobody can complain about in Saddam Hussein, and we can look forward to the order books being full. And, and then it said, in the, and in the future, we can look to Islam to replace communism. Now, this was in, what, 88, 88 89? 89, yeah. And, uh, and it's, it's happened. So uh, you bet the arms industry has been working away trying to uh, uh, build up uh, Islamic fundamentalism to, you, as an enemy. Do you still read that? Because I'm wondering, what are they saying about Iran right now? Because they uh, must yeah, be well, chomping at the bit for this. Exactly. They're, 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 going to go, they're going to bomb Iran. I just can't stand it. It's just going to... It's the arms industry driving war. And so are you a pacifist? Is that, is that your position? No, no, I'm not a pacifist. But, um, but it, you have to recognize, recognize what... What's happening? It's always been the people who profit out of war, who have, even in the Middle Ages, it was the people who are making money out of war who actually promoted war. And that's what's happening now. It's the arms industry um, uh, that's promoting the war. And because they've got a cozy relationship with the politicians. It is a long, strange trip that you've been on to be <laughs> writing these articles and doing this stuff. And for a lot of people, the yeah. life of Brian, yeah. and they think about what yeah. yeah. Do people not know what to say to you when they stop you on the street? <laughs> I, I don't even know who you are. Is it just about like owning your own identity for you? Uh, well, it's, I've just been lucky, you know, because uh, Python has always provided a, a, a certain amount of income. And so I've been able to do what I wanted to do. The and perception from the outside, like you see any comedy troupe, is... It is a band of brothers going forward. But then the more you read about it, you always see in any family there's some kind of dysfunction or yeah. whatever. When you guys were at your peak, were you close? What was that dynamic like? <laughs> well, there was, uh, there was a big argument. I mean, uh, John Cleese only, uh, only threw a chair at me once, I think. Um, uh, but um, but uh, there was always a struggle between, uh, between us because, you know, we were always arguing about what was funny and what wasn't funny. And it usually ended up with the three Cambridge guys saying what was funny and the two Oxford guys saying, no, that isn't funny. <laughs> and and uh, Terry Gilliam was an honorary Oxford <laughs> member of the Oxford. And who do you usually side with, the Oxford guys? Uh, yes, no, I was, yeah. I was at Oxford too. So, so there was three, uh, six of us, yeah. So. And, but I, I wonder with a guy like Terry who's in, but he's not in, but he's in, did he, was he the one that was, um, like, who kept the dynamic working um, for as long as it did? Well... I don't know. I mean, I think all of us kept it one. We wanted it to work. I mean, John was sort of uh, putting the brakes on at the, in, the, in the third series and sort of saying, oh, I, we can't do another series. And, um, but then we did the films, and uh, that, uh, that was uh, great. And did you, when you make stuff like that, do you think about what the long-term effect of it will be? Do you think about making something? No, no. I mean, if he'd said to us when we were doing the TV shows, we'll be still talking about this in 40 years' time, I mean, I would have thought you were loco, you know. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, uh, and, and, and we, with the films, we were also sort of very nervous about the films because we, we didn't know whether anybody would laugh at these things. And uh, so we were always going out on a limb, I, I think. Was there a drive inside you to make a point in with Python, because in the very beginning, especially, you really were able to challenge what people thought yeah. you could do in television. Yeah, I, I, I guess so. You know, there's, a, there's an idea of, uh, of sort of wanting to say something, and I th but I think it's. But really, we were just being silly. We just wanted to be silly and people to laugh at us. And uh, but if you do that and you're intelligent, something you know, your background comes through, I suppose. How different was the dynamic of the of the troop from when you started? to when it kind of, you realize that maybe we're going to have to end this chapter of it. Yeah, well, um, I think it started off with John Clay saying, well, we're all equal and uh, we don't want our, our names up uh, in, in, with uh, 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 subtitles at the end of the show. Um, and by the end of it, uh, everybody wanted their name to be there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, then the ego sets in, right? You get a taste yeah. of what the life yeah, could be like. Yeah, yeah, no. I, actually, we, we're still good friends, actually. I mean, uh, Mike Palin lives a 20 minutes walk across Hampstead Heath uh, for me. 
And Terry Gilliam just is a neighbour, five minutes walk up the road. Just so, wait, yeah, so get sorry. together. <laughs> Has anybody come up to you and said you've been a big influence and you've looked at them and said, I'm really sorry to society, I shouldn't have influenced you? <laughs> <laughs> well, no, let's think about that. I should know, I don't think, I don't, I don't see us being an influence, actually. I, I, I think, you know, we... Yeah, well, you know you have been. Everybody tells you you are. Well, everybody says it, but I don't, I can't see it, really. I mean, I don't, I mean, Eddie Izzard says that we, we, we were a big influence on him, but... But, but I look at his comedy and I think it's just beautiful. It's just, he takes you into this fantasy world that's, um, that's so lovely and it's his own thing. I, that's why I don't really see it. Well, here's what Azar does that you guys did really well. So when you did, you know, there's been great moments where you talk about historical events. Yeah. Eddie Izzard works history in all of his stand-up. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah so course, maybe in a yeah, sense yeah. Of that. For me, Buster Keaton was a, a big hero. Um, I think he made, he showed that comedy can be beautiful. And, uh, and that was uh, such a revelation to me when I, was, uh, when I saw his films the first time. It's great to see you, man. Thank you so much for coming. <laughs> yeah, thanks, John. Really appreciate that. Thank you. Terry Jones, everybody. The website is called healthtips.com, right? Healthtips.com. Make sure you check it out. Especially men, right? Yeah. Men are not good with their own health. Yeah, no, no it's absolutely, yeah. It's, it's my health. My health, my health, my health, my health, health tips.com. Yeah. Go to that yeah. website. Terry Jones, everybody.